best technology law firm in the U.S. Your presenter today is senior attorney Christopher Barnett. He has been representing mid-market and large enterprise clients in high-stakes software licensing transactions and disputes for more than a decade. Today's presentation will be recorded and you will receive a link in the next few days for you're able, and able to access it and download it. Please enter any questions in the questions box and Christopher will answer as many as time allows. For those of you wishing Illinois or California CLE credit, please contact Diana Peterson uh, after the webinar. Please note there is no Texas CLE credit for today's course. Tomorrow, you'll receive a short survey requesting feedback on today's webinar and your ideas for future topics. We appreciate hearing from you. All right, thank you, Marcus. I appreciate the introduction and thank you everybody for attending today's webinar. Um, as advertised, the topic that we're going to cover today is uh, fundamentals of software audit data collection. So um, I, I would estimate probably about, uh, you know, I've never really tried to break it down based on time sheets or anything like that, but maybe around 60 to 75% of my practice is related to either software audits or software licensing reviews of one form or another where we assist our clients to apply different licensing rules and concepts from the agreements they've signed with different software publishers like Microsoft or IBM or Oracle to the uh, usage of their usage of those products in their environment. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of what I add to that equation in terms of a lawyer comes from the application of the laws to the facts and comparing what is appearing in their license agreements um, the, with regard to what they're allowed to use and how they're allowed to use certain products to what they're actually doing with those products. But before I can get to that, um, we always have to have discussions related to collecting data that will allow us to perform that, that analysis. So um, it made sense from our perspective to have a, a webinar on sort of the more mechanical aspects of that process. So how, how we know what we know, how we gather the data that will allow us to confirm what our risks or exposures or complex levels are with respect to these different software products. And that is the topic that we're going to cover today. Um, as indicated on the agenda, I'm going to start with a brief discussion of some of the challenges and risks related to data collection at a high level. Um, and, and past that, we're going to just get into the weeds in terms of what it is that we're trying to gather in terms of data, how we do it, um, what, what the tools are and what the different tricks are for trying to gather information that would be relevant to these views. And keep in mind, this is a publisher neutral presentation. Um, if I was presenting the webinar just on IBM data collection, there are some things in this discussion that I might cover and some things that I wouldn't. And similarly, if this were an Oracle presentation or a Microsoft presentation, there are some kinds of information that are just irrelevant to certain publishers. And there also are some kinds of information that are particularly important to some publishers that are irrelevant to others. So um, I, we might be able to identify some of those during today's call, but this is intended to be really just a high level presentation that would be broadly applicable to most software publishers and the products that um, companies are using in their environment. <clears throat> so um, beginning with the challenges and risks of inaction, software audits, I have that in quotes. Uh, I, I'm gonna use that a little bit as a term of art. Um, sometimes a software audit is something that is initiated by a publisher under a license agreement where it's an enforceable right that they have against their customers, basically, to conduct these types of reviews. Sometimes, though, a software audit is less formal. It might be something initiated by a software sales team wanting to get information about what's in use in an environment so that they can prepare a quote for additional licenses. Sometimes it's an internal exercise. Um, where a company just wants to conduct a health check and confirm, you know, what, what their compliance status is, regardless of, of what type of audit you're talking about, it is a fact of life today. They're unavoidable. You cannot run a business for any length of time um, of any size and not have to address these issues. So it's important to have at least a passing familiarity uh, some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about. 
um, the, the challenges really come down to the difficulty associated with collecting data for modern IT environments. Um, those environments are much more complex these days than they used to be. You're talking about multiple different software publishers, products running in an IT environment. Those environments may be very distributed, either geographically, you know, across different countries, or um, logically in the sense that you might have multiple data centers that might be in the same state, but they might as well not be for all of the, the differences that might exist between those data centers. And you have to have the ability to collect information that's relevant to all those publishers from all those different types of environments, um, and that can definitely be a challenge for any business. Um, however, it is necessary to, to know how to do this. Um, if you fail to address these challenges, it can be it, it can have very severe financial consequences for a company. You might be spending money that you don't need to spend on software. That's that's kind of the most immediate. Uh, risk in terms of the what what you might undergo right now, as opposed to some more remote risks where you, know, you would have lost opportunities for corporate transactions. For example, if you're considering an activity and you can't represent to a buyer what it is that you're using, that may cause them to think twice about um, investing in your company. And then also, um, you know, if you have a publisher initiated audit and you've never conducted this type of a review internally before. You might be setting yourself up for a huge financial hit as a result of that audit where the auditors determine that you've been using the software in excess of the rights that you've purchased and therefore you end up with a bill that you weren't expecting to have to pay and you might not be able to negotiate it away. Um, so, uh, you know, I could probably present an entire additional presentation just related to challenges and risks without getting into sort of the mechanics, but it's important to have in mind at the outset an appreciation for the fact that these are important uh, topics to be able to address within an organization. Um, and, and maybe in a future webinar, we'll, we'll expand on some of these concepts a little bit more. But diving into the, um, <clears throat> to the, the meat of today's discussion, there are really five types, maybe six, depending on um, the, the products that you're looking at, but, but five core data sets that we look to gather during any type of a software audit. The first is the hardware inventory. Just knowing uh, basically a list of computers that are running software. This is present the list in a, a summary fashion so that you have a sense of where we're going with this. But the first thing that we typically try to gather is just that hardware inventory, the list of computers usually organized by computer name. There also would need to be, in most modern IT environments, a virtualization inventory where we are gathering additional information for machines that are not physical computers in your environment, but virtual computers that are set up on um, IT. Machines that we've captured within the hardware inventory, we identify what products are running on those machines that we care about within the scope of a particular review. Um, in addition to all of those hardware pieces, we would typically also need to gather user data. Sometimes that's not necessary depending on what products you're using, but I'd say in most audits we do need to have a sense of who has access to these products or who is actually accessing these products. Um, so that we can apply that information to, to user-based license metrics that may apply for your products in your environment. And then finally, that's all on one side of the equation. That's the what we're using side. The last item here on this list is uh, entitlement data. Um, we need to balance what we're using against what we own. Hopefully, the answer to what we own is not nothing. I've seen that happen. Um, but usually there would be some quantity of software licenses that the company has previously purchased, and we need to compare those license quantities against the usage quantities that we've measured through the other four data sets mentioned above. Not on this list um, is an additional category of information that we'll discuss in a little bit, um, and that would be use characterization information, sort of knowing how products are being used, I'd say that's a bit more of a rare consideration, but it, it is common in the sense that when you're gathering the inventory, 
if you have certain machines that are used for development and test purposes, for example, you might be able to license those deployments under less expensive licensing models than would apply to your production deployments for products that you use you know, in a customer-facing environment or just for your other internal business operation. So that's where we're going to be going um, in more detail on the slides that follow. So the hardware inventory, starting there, that's typically the first thing that we are interested in gathering, or, or at least the first thing that we look at in terms of an um, and what we're really wanting here <clears throat> is a list of all relevant devices in the IT environment. What's a relevant device? So in an, in an IT environment, you might have a collection of different types of computers. Some might be workstations, some might be servers. Those servers might be running different types of operating systems. Some of them might be Microsoft-based or Windows operating systems. Some of them might be a Linux or Unix operating system. Some of them might not even really be computers in the traditional sense, they might be devices that are connected to your network for other purposes, like a switch or a router, or maybe some sort of task-specific appliance. Traditional devices are things that we don't count for purposes of a licensing analysis. We're not capable of running the software that we're interested in. And that's really what we mean by relevant. If it's not capable of running software published by the company who's conducting the audit or, or or that you're interested in for purposes of the analysis, then those machines don't need to be included on the list. But everything else does. So if this were a Microsoft audit that we're talking about, you'd probably be wanting to gather information for pretty much everything um, except for non-Windows devices, you know, machines that don't run a Windows operating system and or, or you know, switches and things like that. But if it is it, other types of publishers, sometimes they have very scope of your scan to just the machines that are capable of running those products. Um, so within the hard, we want to know the make and model of each device, who built it and what, what the model number is. That sometimes can be important for the analysis. We also have to have information in most cases related to the um, process, the computer processors that are um, deployed on those devices. Um, so that would be a physical processor and associated processor cores for physical physical computers. For virtual computers, that you wouldn't have physical virtual. I mean, we'll cover virtual computers a little bit more uh, on the virtualization slides. Uh, and then also, um, we might want to be collecting a secondary inventory to validate the completeness of the main hardware inventory. Usually that's a, a larger concern the first time you go through one of these reviews because you're wanting to validate that whatever tool you're using in order to gather the hardware inventory is doing a good job. But it, it's usually a best practice, I'd say, to, com to have that secondary inventory in most reviews if you can. Um, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail on uh, a slide later on. So the tools that you use to do this, usually you're going to want to use some type of an automated data collection tool in order to gather this information. It's just it's the, the most common way that these tasks are approached, and it is um, labor-saving and typically more accurate to use some type of data collection tool. You still have to validate that that tool is doing its job correctly, um, and that, that is a part of the, the analysis process. Um, but this is usually going to be a better way to complete the hardware inventory than one of the more manual methods that I'll talk about on the next slide. But within the universe of tools, there's broadly speaking two types. There's going to be an agent-less tool or an agent-based tool. An agent-less tool is going to be a software program that uses just one machine within a network and from that one machine, you tell the tool to go out and gather information from all the other computers in the environment. Um, in order to do that, you usually would have to log into the tool using some sort of administrative credentials for your network so that the tool would actually be able to connect to all those other devices. Um, but uh, that, that, I would say, is probably the most common tool that is used, at least in my experience, because it's easier um, to deploy. You don't have to worry about more than that one installation. And once you get past the initial configuration hurdles and making sure you have all of those credentials set up, it's, uh, it's typically a bit quicker 
to, um, to deploy the tool and to gather the information using that type of an agentless system. Some good examples here would be Microsoft's um, MAP toolkit. That's actually a little duplicative. It's the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit, which is a free is another common tool that I believe, at least last time I looked, was still an agent-less tool um, that can be used in this way. An agent-based tool is kind of the opposite of that. You still have a centralized deployment, usually to collect information from the machines within the environment, but that centralized deployment is not really going out and gathering information directly from other computers. It's waiting to hear um, from the agent installs are run on those other computers. So if you have a network that consists of, say, one of the workstations and one server, just for an example, you would install on the server the data repository, and then you would install agents, which are relatively small software components, on each of the 100 workstations within the environment. The central console then would tell each of the agents when you're wanting to collect an inventory, hey, send me your inventory data, and they would send over to the that central data repository everything that they've learned about that local machine. Agent-based tools are more difficult to set up. Obviously, you have to go and install the agents on all of those 100 workstations, but they usually do a better job of gathering information because um, the, having the agent on the system often allows the tool to gather a wider variety of information. Sometimes these are management tools in addition to just data collection tools where you can actually modify those endpoints. Um, and you also um, sometimes are able to overcome certain networking related issues that might prevent an agent less tool from working effectively in the environment. And I've provided some examples on, on this set as well. So Landesk, which I'll probably always call Landesk, regardless of what they rename it, as well as IBM's license metric tool, which is not a tool I would necessarily recommend, but you may have to use it under certain circumstances in order to gather information about IBM products in your environment. But those are both agent-based. Um, if you don't want to do the automated approach, there is the option, in some cases anyway, of conducting a manual inventory. We typically don't recommend that because especially once you get to be of a certain size, if you're more than just you know a handful of workstations maybe, having a, a manual spreadsheet or something else that you um, set up and update on a periodic basis is usually a recipe for trouble because those things tend not to be updated as frequently as they should be or maybe they're not gathering all of the information that you need them to gather and to the extent that something was missed, you might have to start over and gather all the information all over again. So um, that's an option. I've seen it, but it's not something I would necessarily recommend. Um, and with regard to secondary inventory, so you have your, in your main hardware inventory that you've gathered through Landesk or something else. Um, in order to gauge whether Landesk is doing a good job of gathering that information, it usually makes sense to compare that hardware inventory against the secondary inventory, which might be a list of devices within Active Directory if you're running a Windows-based environment, or it might be a list of devices covered by an antivirus solution. If you know that you have installed an antivirus solution on all of the computers in your network, then a list of devices generated by that antivirus tool is probably gonna be a pretty good list of the machines that you're actually running. That doesn't give you enough information to conduct an analysis, usually just a list of, of machines along with whatever version for something like 95% coverage, making sure that the tool is gathering information for at least 95% of the machines in the environment or the machines shown on that secondary inventory. Where we can't hit that target, we usually want to go back and see if we can improve the coverage rate before we start with any type of a substantive analysis. So next we have the virtualization inventory. Just for those who might be unfamiliar with the terminology, you know, most people are familiar with the, an environment where you would have physical workstations or a physical server and the workstations connect to the server over a phone line or some other type of networking line. 
a virtualized computing environment would take a physical machine, usually a, a powerful physical server, effectively, and it would um, create virtual machines within that physical computer. So it's, it's a logical partition of that physical machine's processing and data storage capability. And those virtual machines act like but you don't you can't go out and touch them they're they're only a, a partition a sort of a logical partition or a, an intangible server um, that is running on that physical host machine so when we're collecting data we need to know in many cases which hosts which of those physical machines are running which of the virtual servers or virtual workstations in your environment this can be particularly important um, within certain types of licensing regimes where you might have to pay additional from one other, we need to know where these things are running. And that's the one of the main purposes of the virtual uh, virtualization inventory. Um, when we um, when we do this, let me get to the next slide. There are some publishers that um, where this this type of information can be especially critical. Oracle is a good example of that, mainly because Oracle does not recognize certain virtualization technologies, including probably the world's most popular virtualization technology, which is VMware, as being sufficient to limit the number of licenses which you would need to purchase for your virtual machine. If you're running a, a VMware virtualization environment, having that information is gonna be particularly important in an Oracle audit, mainly because you're not gonna be able to rely on any sort of virtual processor count associated with your VM as being relevant to what you have an obligation to buy in terms of licenses. There are other publishers where it is important to have this information, but if you're not using the right data collection tools, um, you might be in the same position as you are with Oracle and VMware. IBM will allow you to um, use its software in virtualized environments, but if you're going to try to license based on the capacity just of those virtual servers, as opposed to the full physical capacity of your host, you have to use IBM's license metric tool within your environment. There are some exceptions to that rule, but they're pretty limited and most companies can't satisfy the criteria to apply them. So you have to set yourself up for either deploying the license metric tool with those IBM deployments for your virtualized environment or just licensing the full physical capacity. So before you play software in a virtualized computing environment, you need to know what the license rules say about using uh, the, the software in one of those environments. And consequently, that will give you the information that you need to know in order to collect an effective um, inventory for that virtualized environment. So um, the virtualization inventory is going to consist of a list that basically maps each of the virtual machines to their respective hosts. That's one important component. We also need to get information regarding the basically the same type of information that we gathered in the hardware inventory for those physical hosts. Sometimes host machines don't show up in the hardware inventory that you collect from something like Map Toolkit or Landesk or something like that. Um, so they can't be using the tool. Um, one of the other pieces of information that we need to collect in the virtualization inventory, therefore, is the, the make and model of each of those physical hosts, as well as the processor and core information for those physical hosts, because you might be needing to license software based on those physical attributes, rather than whatever uh, information you've gathered for the virtual processor. collect that information. Um, we also typically need to know whether a virtual server is able to move across the network from one physical host to another. It's a very common um, configuration in modern IT. 
um, where uh, you have that type of a high availability or failover functionality set up that would allow a VM to keep running, for example, if the host that it was on starts to fail. Um, but, you know, if there's a problem with the host or if you're having problems with the capacity on a host getting too high and you might be having performance issues, then the VM can shift from that host to another host. But most publishers, if you do that, will require you by default to license that other host. Um, and so there are rules that we can apply depending on what, whatever um, license metrics or licensing rules a publisher has set up um, to determine whether um, that movement results in additional licensing obligations. So we need to gather that information as well. Um, and just emphasize the point, most inventory tools just don't gather this information well. Some purport to. If you run the MAP toolkit, there is a, a report that you can generate out of the MAP toolkit for your, your virtualized environment, including um, there are options to report on VMware, but that's not going to work unless you have specifically configured the MAP toolkit to gather that information, and even then, I don't know that I've ever seen a MAP toolkit VMware report that I would necessarily trust. So it typically makes sense to gather this information separately, usually from the virtualization tool itself. So if you're running VMware, you would gather this information out of VMware, either directly from the console or using another tool. So here are some examples on that piece. Again, VMware, you can, I believe you can run either queries or, or generate reports directly out of VMware, but we typically recommend that our clients with VMware environments run um, a free third-party tool called RV Tools, which um, for VM administrators to gather all the information that they need in order to manage the environment. But included within all of that information is everything that you would need for a licensing analysis. So um, it's a free just add-on to the um, the VMware um, deployment. The feedback I've had from my clients is that RV tools are pretty easy to use, and a lot of businesses are using it already. So if it's already in your environment, you don't have to worry about trying to get the VMware info from other sources. Microsoft has its own virtualization technology called Hyper-V. If you're using Microsoft-based um, inventory tools like System Center or Map Toolkit, you probably are going to be able to gather the information that you need for your Hyper-V environment, but it also might be necessary to supplement that information with the outputs from PowerShell queries. The PowerShell query is just a, a little a search or a query that you run against a, a Microsoft resource um, at the command line or using other tools, and that it can it, it, it'll generate a report just on an ad hoc basis when you run the query. So for Hyper-V, you might need to supplement it with that. There are lots of other virtualization technologies. It's by no means intended to be a definitive list. Citrix has its own technologies. Um, Oracle has um, the Oracle VM technology as well as Solaris. Um, IBM has its logical partitions or LPARs. Um, and there are others besides all of those as well. So if you're using one of these other technologies, it, you might need to speak with the subject matter experts at your company who are responsible for managing those environments um, to get information from them related to what, you know, what they can provide for the licensing analysis. Um, because it may be something where if it's a, a more obscure virtualization technology, you might need to get a bit more creative in terms of how you report on this information. But usually there is some type of automated way to gather it. If you can't gather this information automatically or in an automated way, this is one exception to the manual data collection rule that I might allow um, because the hardware used to support your virtualization environment, except for very large companies, usually is fairly static. It's not going to be changing that much from day to day or week to week or even month to month. So if you maintain a manual inventory of your virtualization infrastructure, that might be appropriate. But I would say only if it's otherwise going to be difficult for you to use an automated tool. I typically like to gather the information live as necessary uh, for purposes of an analysis because that's usually going to yield a better result. Um, and okay, so the next thing, moving on from software the excuse me, the software deployment inventory. So now we have a list of 
machines and our hardware inventory. We know where our virtual machines are running and we know about their virtual, virtual hosts. So we sort of have a picture of the environment or at least the footprint of the environment, what, what all the devices look like, what the population looks like. But we don't know anything yet about what's running on those devices except perhaps for the operating system of each of the machines. So we now need to collect the software deployment inventory. Um, and this would identify all relevant, is that word again, software installations on the machines in the hardware inventory. Again, if this is a Microsoft audit, we don't need the software inventory to include information about IBM products. That's just going to give you a lot more work and not going to benefit the analysis at all. So usually there's going to be some sort of a filtering to the data that we collect at this stage, either on the front end and trying to control what we're searching for, or on the back end and trying to exclude from the outputs anything pertaining to products that aren't published by the, the, the vendor in question. Um, if this is part of a broader type of analysis, if this is not a publisher-initiated audit, or if it's not something where you're worried about what your license position is for, for Microsoft or IBM specifically, you might be doing a you know a broader just licensing health check to see how see what your license position is for multiple software vendors, or you might be contemplating a merger or acquisition or something else where you would need to provide a third party with information about your your compliance status for different software products. Um, it might it might be necessary to look for more than one type of software product, and it also might be a good idea to segregate your reviews because mixing a, a Microsoft review with a, an Oracle and an IBM review is going to be pretty consuming so or pretty confusing. Excuse me. So it probably makes sense to do these things um, in discrete chunks, but overall you might be looking for more than just one type of product depending on what type of review you're conducting. And the data that we're looking for here is going to consist of the, the name of the publisher. Usually you're going to want to know that if, it's, if that information is included in whatever data repository you're looking at for this software information, um, as well as the, the name of the software products that are installed, the versions of those products usually is going to be very important because you'll need to be able to match the version that you have licensed against the version that you're actually using. And then the product edition. And so there's a uh, version and edition sometimes are used interchangeably by businesses, but for, for people who work with these concepts day to day, they mean very different things. A version of a product would be, um, you know, uh, Windows 8.1 versus Windows 10. The 8.1 or 10 signifies a new release of the product. That is a version. Um, so we need to be able to know if it's, if it's either that or if it's SQL Server 2016 versus SQL Server 2005, that's the version information. The addition refers to a, uh, um, a different model of the software, if you want to think of it that way. So within the SQL Server realm, if you're talking about SQL Server 2016, if, that, if all you have in your environment is SQL Server 2016, then that, that answers the version question. But you then need to know, are you running SQL Server Express? SQL Server Standard, SQL Server Enterprise, all of those adjectives that come after the project product name are the additions, and they usually entail very different prices. Therefore, we need to know if you're running um, SQL Server Enterprise versus Express. Enterprise is extremely expensive. SQL Server Express is free. So we would want to exclude the SQL Server Express installs from uh, an analysis of what you're obligated to buy in terms of licenses. So we need to try to gather that addition information. Challenges related to um, gathering this software inventory, there, there are a number of them, and they vary from publisher to publisher, but there are some common ones. One, with respect to that addition information in particular, um, usually a software data collection tool, and, and, and for the most part, we're going to be using the same tools to gather the software data that we use to gather the hardware data. Usually they can do both. Um, sometimes there might be exceptions to that rule, but I think for, for the large majority of automated tools that you would be using, they would gather both the hardware info and interested in. But usually these tools are going to be looking for certain data within certain places on each computer. If it's a Windows-based tool, 
It'll be looking at the Windows registry, which is basically just a list of um, different uh, configurations, different system attributes within a computer, which includes a list of installed software. Sometimes uh, the, the Windows registry or, or other data repository for other kinds of systems doesn't provide all the information you need about SQL Server, again, is a good example. Um, if you go to the add remove programs list, for example, of a Windows system, which is generally is reflective of the system registry for installed software, um, that, that, that list typically will not tell you what edition of SQL Server you're writing. You're going to have to look somewhere else to gather that information. Some tools know that. Uh, Map Toolkit actually does a pretty good job of finding the edition from other sources, but some tools don't. They look in the system registry, they spit out whatever information there, and if that information didn't include the addition, you're going to have an additional set that you have to take in order to complete the inventory. So um, that's one challenge. Um, usually the, the raw information that you obtain from your automated tool is going to include lots of information that is irrelevant to your licensing analysis. Even if you have limited your search, for example, just for product include the word Microsoft, you're going to get a software inventory that includes that you pay for, like SQL Server, and all products that you don't have to pay for, like updates and, and other things that, that are just cluttering up the view. So in most cases, you're going to need to go through a filtering exercise to exclude those. Um, but that's once you get used to knowing what you're looking for, um, also, in any cases, products are sold with additive licenses to unlock certain features and functionalities or, or to unlock your right to use certain features or functionalities that would be optional for the baseline program. Um, all of the good example of this, if you go by Oracle Database Enterprise Edition, the software ships with all sorts of added cost options included with the media. Some things are actually configured to run from Go, and you have to opt out of them. Um, but the you know software data collection tools don't always capture information related to what options might be enabled on certain software products. So you often have to supplement your software installation reporting with um, details related to what features or functionalities are enabled on each of the deployments that you've captured in that inventory, and that can take some time, obviously. Um, but it's all important, especially going back to the Oracle question, those Oracle options uh, sometimes end up costing companies as much as the database software itself to the extent that they've uh, unwittingly enabled a lot of things that cost a lot of extra money. So having, having the tools to gather this information or at least having the knowledge of knowing where to look is critically important for many products. Um, the next category of information would be user data. So in cases, there are two parts of a licensing obligation. You have to obtain a license to actually install and run the software. And then in many cases, you have to go out and buy additional licenses for users or devices to connect to those software in um, Microsoft parlance, those are called client access licenses or CALs. At least that's one example of them. There are other software publishers have different terminology. Also, there are some products that don't include and don't require you to license the installation. You only buy licenses for the users. Um, if you are licensing software under Microsoft's uh, services provider license agreement, for example, um, there are products there that you just have the option of licensing based on user counts as opposed entirely to based on processor or core counts. And so you would need to be able to gather information related to those users. Similarly with um, other publishers like IBM has Cognos Business Intelligence or whatever they're calling it now. Um, that, that product is, uh, I think they offer a, a processor-based license metric, but the most common is metric historically has been authorized users who have the ability to access certain Cognos features. Um, and that can be a very complicated but entirely user and group-based analysis as opposed to hardware-based. Um, 
Also, it's important to have this information outside of a licensing context just to know who's on your system because it might be the case that you have a lot of users in your directories that are no longer part of your company and you don't want them to be able to access your software installations, but maybe they still have credentials to do so. So it makes sense periodically to just review your user lists and make sure they're up to date and you've disabled or deleted any inactive or otherwise unneeded accounts going forward. Um, data sources for the user data vary widely in Windows environments. Usually the first stop and maybe the only stop is going to be a list of users set up within Active Directory, which is just a, it's sort of a network management functionality that is included with Windows operating systems. And Active Directory can generate a list of users as well as lists of groups to which those users belong. And you might want to enable access to certain server products based on membership within those groups. So if you can, if you can configure your Active Directory environment in that way, then you might, need, you might not need to gather any user data from any other source, which makes it pretty handy. But not all, not all software products are set up like that because not all of them run within a Windows environment. Um, and you might be needing to collect this information from other sources. There are some tools like Map Toolkit or System Center that can measure user access to software products over time. Um, but if this is your first time conducting an inventory for that particular publisher's products, you might not have had enough time to get those tools configured and to run them over a period of time to confirm that they're user access to these products. So um, when you're considering your options for deploying a tool, it probably makes sense to speak with the vendors and see what functionalities they can bring to the table in order to accomplish that. And then maybe have an initiative set up to, to run that and then periodically confirm the, the, the user um, measurement piece, user access measurement piece of the solution is working properly. But um, in many cases, if you don't have the time to do that or you haven't done it previously, you're going to need to be looking at potentially user lists from other sources. Maybe there's an application that you're running on a server and that application can generate a user list. That might be an option. But it, it is going to vary from, um, from product to product and vendor to vendor. Um, challenges with regard to user data. So one comment that comes up commonly with respect to many different publishers is this concept of pooling or multiplexing, where if you were to generate a list, for example, out of Active Directory, maybe it only has like five user accounts in it, and three of them are administrators. Um, and, and you know, however, that you've got 200 people within your organization using software. So why is there that disconnect? Well, one or more of those accounts within Active Directory might be basically a dummy account. It's not necessarily associated with any particular user, but it might be associated, for example, with an application. And within that application, users log in. They log into the application rather than to the server. And that application has an account within Active Directory. And therefore, all of those users are basically getting funneled down and they're accessing the server through that one service account or that shared account. Most software publishers have licensing rules that say that you cannot limit your obligation to buy a user license by setting up these types of pooled accounts. You have to buy everybody who accesses the software either directly through an Active Directory account or indirectly through one of these service or shared accounts. Um, so you need to have tools set up that will allow you to gather information related to shared accounts and to track them ideally over time. Um, this is a question that comes up very commonly within audits, and if you're not able to demonstrate who the user base is who are accessing a product or a server through a shared account, the auditors might make certain assumptions that you won't like about the number of users who are doing so, maybe based on headcounts or something else. So um, it, you, you need to have some sort of methodology set up to gather that information. Um, also, non-Windows environments may be more difficult to query. I mentioned this a minute ago. Windows environments typically have, though not always, typically have Active Directory set up so that it's, it can be at least a one-stop shop to gather your user information. But 
even within Windows environments, if you haven't previously set up Active Directory, which would be relatively uncommon, or if you're not using a Windows-based um, operating systems in your environment, then that may not be an option, and you may need to look for user data from other sources. Um, use characterization. So this is the item that wasn't on that, that one slide at the beginning um, that was looking at these things at a summary level. Um, in many cases, you'll need to know how certain software products are being used. This isn't always important because some software publishers may not offer very meaningful distinctions between production use and development or testing use. Everybody has to have the same license, so you may not need to gather this information. But in a lot of cases, it is important to know. And it, for example, with Microsoft, um, you might have production licenses that you buy under an enterprise agreement for most of your environment, but you also might have a team of users that has um, development or testing um, job functions where they, they create new programs for you or they test products before they move into production. And for those users, instead of buying production licenses, you may have the option of buying a subscription license under um, MSDN, uh, which is a, a development, developer tools subscription license bundle, basically, that would allow you to run certain tools like Visual Studio, which is a programming interface typically, along with um, other products like SQL Server, Windows Server, or Exchange that those users are authorized to use for development or testing purposes um, at no additional charge past the subscription license price. So in paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of SQL Server licensing for those users to use, you would instead buy those users an annual MSDN subscription, which might be four to seven thousand dollars depending on which subscription level you get, but that's substantially less expensive than having to purchase production licenses for those users. So um, if you've done that, you need to know which deployment, which installations and computers in your environment are used exclusively by those MSDN users. This is not information that a tool can gather. Um, it's something that you have to know about your environment or have to have the ability to determine. We often recommend that our clients either segregate their dev test environments logically or physically if possible, um, or at the very least give the dev test servers um, different names so that you can identify them at a glance and, and identify them as such to a software auditor in the event that you have an audit. Another focus here that I've highlighted on this slide is the commercial hosting concept. So most publishers will say that you can use their product that you've licensed for your internal business purposes as much as you want up to your, up to your entitled capacity, but they'll also typically say you cannot use your software licenses to provide some sort of a hosted service to your customers. So if, you're a, if you are a solution vendor and you want to offer a web-based tool for your customers to use for one purpose or another, um, you might want to build that tool on a Windows Server operating system and maybe you want to use a SQL Server database to support it. You can't do that in most cases under, an inter under licenses that you get through an enterprise agreement. Um, with Microsoft, they have, a, uh, with some exceptions, which I won't get into here, but they have a different licensing regime called SPLA, the Services Provider License Agreement, that is a completely different licensing model. It's a month-to-month -month reporting model rather than a capital expenditure, go buy some licenses model. Um, and that is what you would need to use for your commercial hosting use cases. So again, you need to know which, if any, of your software deployments in your environment are used for commercial hosting purposes and segregate them if at all possible. Ideally, physically, you don't want to just have a logical segregation, in my opinion, between your internal use and your customer-facing deployments. It'd be best if they are on completely separate physical infrastructure, and you need to be able to identify what's what and to demonstrate who has access to those things. So, again, this is not information that an automated tool is going to know how to collect. There's no attribute of a computer that can tell a tool that it be used for commercial hosting purposes. You just have to know. Um, you know, there are some exceptions to that. You might be able to demonstrate, for example, that certain computers are only accessed by internal users. But again, that's, that's knowing who those users are 
it's not something that the tool can figure out, but it's often a critical piece of the data analysis that we need to conduct in this type of a review. All right, so all of, all of what we just discussed, again, goes on the what we're using side of the equation. On the other side of the equation is what we own in terms of software licenses. We need to know what your entitled level of usage is for each product that's relevant to the review that you're conducting. Um, usually the best sources of information related to your entitlements are going to be either license and support agreements that you have with your vendors or order documentation or invoices. Um, in many cases, you can um, request that your value-added reseller or maybe the publisher itself um, can provide you with a spreadsheet that shows the history of your product licenses over time. Microsoft is a really good example of this. If you have an authorized reseller for Microsoft products, that reseller can generate what's called a Microsoft Volume Licensing Statement, which provides excellent level of detail both at a transaction level basis and, and at a summary level um, regarding all of the licenses that you've purchased within Microsoft volume licensing frameworks unless there's been an error somewhere. You might have, for example, some M&A activity and Microsoft may not know to associate an acquired entity's licenses with your company's licenses, but these things can be corrected and once they are, it's usually a pretty complete picture of what you purchased through one of those volume licensing agreements. The only thing that would be left out would be something that you purchased outside of those agreements, like um, retail licenses or OEM licenses that came pre-installed on the computer, or maybe licenses that you acquired from a different um, solution vendor that that is bundling Microsoft or some other publisher's licenses with its own products. Um, usually Microsoft won't have information related to those things, so you would need to supplement it. But wherever possible, regardless of whether it's Microsoft or another vendor, if you can go to your reseller and ask them to generate that type of a purchase history, that may be all the information that you need to collect on the entitlement side. Um, and then occasionally you might be able to rely on license certificates or other documents that you might receive from a vendor in connection with its products. but Usually those, those certificates are not dated as usual for purposes of an analysis, especially if you're trying to determine your, uh, your license position at a particular point in time. Challenges with related to um, entitlements, the, the easiest one to think of is the fact that you, you know, most companies license software from different vendors and different vendors have different license metrics. So you can't, in most cases, just include all publishers' license data on a single spreadsheet. Or you can, but you just have to know to filter it appropriately and only look at, at relevant information for each publisher. You have to be familiar with how these products are licensed um, and what information needs to be reflected on the entitlement record so that you can accurately compare that against what it is that you're using. Another very common problem is what we internally here uh, often referred to as document soup and the best example of this is IBM. IBM, if, for those of you familiar with Star Trek, IBM is like the Borg. They will go through the universe and gobble up all sorts of smaller software vendors and then rebrand those software vendors products as their own. Um, over time, IBM might change the license metrics applicable to those products common set of metrics in the portfolio. In many cases, at least for a while after IBM has acquired these companies, they may still be licensing those companies' products based on the legacy license metrics, which may be very different than the license metrics that IBM applies. Also, those products might be subject to legacy license agreements that may include different types of usage rights or, or allowances that those legacy vendors allowed their customers to apply and that IBM does not or that IBM won't going forward. Um, so it can be extremely challenging in IBM, in some types of IBM reviews to figure out exactly what a company is entitled to do with the licenses that it previously purchased, especially in new companies that IBM has since acquired. Uh, IBM does do a very good job, I will say, of making all of its license terms, or most of them anyway, available 
on its website. Um, you can do a Google search for IBM license information and search up the product specific license information sheets, which typically provide excellent detail related to how products are licensed and what you're able to do with them. Um, but again, to the extent that you are still maybe subject to older than not on IBM's website, you still might have to be looking at, at other sources of information to figure out exactly what you're entitled to do. So on the entitlement side, it's usually critical for legal teams to get involved early during a software review so that they can start compiling a repository of information and documents related to that entitlement analysis and confirming what a company is, uh, is, is licensed to do with certain software products. Um, and so a final reminder here, just generally speaking with respect to all of these data collection processes, you know, having tools, having a good tool is important. Having a good repeatable audit and analysis processes also is important, but it's not a sufficient condition for success. You're going to need periodically to test your tools and your processes to make sure that they are gathering all of the information that you need and that's relevant to each license review. Um, and, and effectively, you have to audit your own audit. And that means, for example, with respect to the hardware inventory, periodically confirming it against that Active Directory hardware list or antivirus list. Um, with respect to entitlements, just making sure that you've accounted for all recent acquisitions of software licenses and everything is up to date. These things need to be checked over time. If you allow that to slip, then when you do eventually get audited and everybody eventually gets audited, either if it's publisher initiated, like we were saying at the beginning, or if it's something related to M&A activity or just an internal health check, you're going to be setting yourself up for problems to the extent that you haven't tested these tools and processes um, before that. Um, so just some final conclusions. Again, as I was just mentioning, it makes sense to undertake some periodic proactive licensing health checks where you, you test that all of these tools are working correctly and that you have a firm understanding of what, what's deployed and that you're up to date in terms of all the licenses that you need in order to support those deployments. That's usually a holistic process that involves multiple teams within a company. Um, so um, having, having processes not, not only set up just to gather the information, but also to periodically test the gathering of that information, I'd say especially for larger companies is going to be a critical step to take. Um, also, um, in connection with third-party audits, um, it usually makes sense to have some assistance with that, especially if you are unfamiliar with how those third-party products are licensed or if you haven't undertaken these steps um, in advance of undertaking that review. Um, so, um, obviously, that's something that Scott and Scott handles on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I said, it's probably three-quarters of my practice is helping, company, helping companies with exactly that task. Um, but regardless of who does it, if you're not familiar with these concepts, there are so many pitfalls, I would say, associated with licensing, especially server products um, across larger environments, that going into these matters blindly or assuming that the information, all of the information that the auditors have requested is relevant to their review and is um, important for them to know about is, is setting yourself up for problems. So we, we typically recommend that our clients seek the assistance either of counsel or of knowledgeable licensing consultants for that. Um, so I think that that concludes everything that I had in terms of prepared remarks. Um, uh, if there are any questions, we will gather those um, and I will plan to reply to them after the audit via email. Um, and that, that's it for today. I appreciate everybody attending. Thank you.